okay, this is intentional focus on another level. This is like elevated beyond, like this is why you did what you did. But something happened before we hit record that I will never forget for the rest of my life. Welcome back to another episode of The Burn. I am Ben Newman, and you know how we do this every single week. We're going to bring you a story of an athlete, an entertainer, a celebrity, somebody who is recognized in their life that why and purpose is not enough. There's this underlying burn that ignites your why and purpose that causes you to show up on the days you don't feel like it, and especially after you win. Today, we are bringing you one of the greatest athletes, one of the greatest champions to ever walk the face of the earth. And I've said it before, there's no coincidence and things happen at certain times. And you've heard, you know, whether it be an introduction I make from this person that this individual, yes, he was on the Mental Toughness Forum a couple of years ago, which was absolutely incredible. But little did we know how much we had in common then, and little did we know what would happen when we finally connected, when Tim Grover was saying we needed to connect, and Frisella was saying, I've heard from so many people through the years, Ben, you and Phil Heath have finally got to meet. Dr. Lyon was like, you guys have got to meet. And when we met at the Arnold this year, there was a bond that just, it was like immediate, like, man, like, we, we know each other. And then I'm going to tell you, before we hit the record button today, something happened. You guys know how emotional I am. I I may get into tears before we even get started. I'm going to make you wait on what we're going to share. But something happened before we hit record that I will never forget for the rest of my life. And it will forever unite Phil Heath and I at at a level that, that many people will never understand. And I'm going to let you just kind of think, like, what is he possibly talking about? Because there's things that we have to talk about with Phil that are just incredible, that are currently happening with him as a result of the choices he made and how he decided to live his life and how he does live his life. So we're going to get to this special moment he and I have. I am going to make you wait on it. And right now, I want to introduce you to my dear friend, Phil Heath. Welcome to The Burn. Yes, sir. Great to be here, brother. Thanks for having me. I got to tell you, you know, you had the, you still do have the nickname, The Gift. You know, a lot of people like to call you Champ. Seven-time Mr. Olympia. But there's so much to your story that people just don't even know. When when we met at the Arnold and it, it was just amazing having that opportunity to finally talk and my son Isaac comes down and we're talking hoop like, most people don't look at you like, wait, he was a D1 hooper? Wait, he hooped <laughs> yeah. with Jamal Crawford in high school? Wait, like, he could dunk? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't even think some people even know where your work ethic, passion, fire, desire came from, and it was on a basketball court. So, Phil, this, this is your mic. This is your floor. I'd love for you to help people understand, like, where did Phil Heath find that burn that lies inside of him? Man, I'd probably say early on in life where I realized competition is everything, dude. Like to compete at something. It's one thing to have a hobby, which is great. But then to see what you're truly made of by competing in it. So it didn't matter if it was playing, you know, hopscotch. It didn't matter if we're playing checkers. It didn't matter if we're playing Nintendo. It didn't matter. (laughs) Everything became a competition. And, you know, I grew up as an only child in Seattle, Washington. And fortunately for me... I was around a few other athletes. One in particular was Nate Burleson and his family. He had, he was one of four boys, right? So their father played in the NFL and the CFL. And I used to go over their house and I was like, man, this guy's, you know, buff. And he's always bringing over these big guys and working out. And little did I realize at the time that he had played professional sports. And I always wanted to compete with his sons you know, with Kevin Burleson and with Nate. And we always like, who's the fastest, who could shoot the best, you know, playing a hoop. And that was also back in the day where at elementary school, where we all attended, 
who's the fastest, who could do the shuttle run, you know, who could do the flex arm hang, like those President's Council of Fitness tests. There was no participation ribbons given back then in the 80s and early 90s. Like it just wasn't the case. And I always wanted to be the best. I knew that I was short. And I remember crying to the doctor when they <laughs> bring out the chart <laughs> of saying, like, this is how tall you're going to be. And I was like, oh, there's no, there's no one that tall in the NBA. And, and, then here, and then here comes Spud Webb, you know. And I'm like, okay, so he can dunk. I'm like, what does it take to dunk? Well, you got to work hard. I was like, well, I'll I'll do whatever it takes. So I was the kid that – would see something, have a limiting belief, and then see someone else do it. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's like that story of Roger Bannister, right? You know, with the four minute mile. And once he did it, that everybody else could do it. Sometimes you just need to be able to get around somebody else that has done it. And then you visualize it. And then you go ahead and do it. And I was never afraid of hard work. And, you know, growing up again, I mean, it was just, I was surrounded by other athletes. And I always just thought, man, I want to be the best. I don't want to be lagging behind. I don't want to be second best. I, the second best sucks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was fortunate to have strong male role models, you know, the coaches be okay with that. Like they were all about winning too. Everything was competitive. My, my middle school gym teacher, still alive. His name is Ron Howard. This man played tight end for the Seahawks and the Dallas Cowboys and had a Super Bowl ring. So imagine being 13 years old and your gym teacher's got a Super Bowl ring. And you're looking at, everybody's looking at the Super Bowl ring. You know what I'm looking at, Ben? I'm looking at his fingers mangled like mm. this. Because he played in the 70s, man. Mm. So his fingers are like this. Well, so he would talk and he'd be like, so what you got to do? And I thought he was just trying to be like, cool. No, man, his hands are messed up. Mm. So I realized everything comes with a price. And that's okay because he's got the ring. And I thought, man, I, I want that. I, I want to be pro. I want to be pro at something. And in fact, when I was interviewed <laughs> after I got my Division I scholarship my senior year to the <clears throat> University of Denver, I was interviewed by the Seattle Times and they said, you know, you already have high hopes to do something in hoops. What are your thoughts? And I said, well, I don't know about the NBA, but I'm going to be pro at something. And that was a godsend, man, because I knew that I was never afraid of hard work. I was always being competitive at every little thing, every little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who could do the fastest this? Who could do the best that? Like, that's just what mattered back then. And I still think it matters today. And that's what, when I was introduced to bodybuilding, it was the perfect sport for me because it was all about just the effort that I was willing to put forth. You know, you could spot me. But that's not getting the job done. You can encourage me, but I still got to eat those meals. I still have to be willing to do the work when no one else is watching. And that's something I know you preach about all every day. Oh, we, we are, we are going to talk about that. But I got to make one more hoop story before we get into <laughs> that and breaking Olympia, the Phil Heath story and this amazing documentary that like you all better watch it. I'm going to put links to it, clips to it. If you don't want to buy it, I'll buy it for you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't rent it. I bought the thing. I'm like, Thank I haven't you. even watched yeah. it yet. I'm like, this is my guy. I I'm purchasing because I will watch this multiple times over. It's that. And it was even better than that. But before we get there, there's one story you shared with me, which is really unique. Because sometimes I think when I talk about this concept of the burn and people hear my mom's story, they're like, I could understand that. Like you're, you're fighting to continue to write her story every day. And some people have that pain. And then other people are like, well, I've never had anything happen to where I figured out what that burn was. And, and part of your burn, and you shared this amazing story with me about your coach who got mad at you for not dunking the basketball, who <laughs> lit a fire. And, and that, to me, that's part of the burn. Like, he helped yeah. you find this fire inside of you. You got to tell us that story before we start talking about that <laughs> seven-time Mr. Olympia body oh. of yours. Oh, man. So a uh, shout-out to Coach Bethia at Rainier Beach High School, which, you know, they've got – a lot of great champions that have come out of there. It's got nine state titles. I mean, it's phenomenal. But, you know, I, I was always really athletic. And my biggest thing, being under six feet, was to jump high and just to get the shot off. And I used to lay the ball up or do a floater and it would get blocked. 
And he would get so upset along with a lot of other people saying, well, why don't you just dunk it? That's all you got to do, Phil. And I was just, and I was timid. So he decided to bench me <laughs> and I'm a starter. I'm like I'm supposed to be the man, you know, like he benched me and I'm like, okay, not only did he bench me, he made me run during halftime. I was like, okay, you're embarrassing me now. So of course, you know, any competitive person that gets embarrassed, they want to get some get back. So I remember stealing the ball from a guy instead of going down court and just laying the ball up. I dunked it so freaking hard where <laughs> the ball like went through and it bounced like super high, <laughs> almost hit me, you know, and you're like getting back instead of like pounding your chest and like, yeah, you know, you're like, I'm like dead eye looking at my coach, like, see, you know, like F you, you know, like whatever, you know, <laughs> but then it clicked and he's looking at me like, see, <laughs> I already saw it within you. This is what I had to do to pull it out of you. And now you're able to get a glimpse of what your potential truly is. And now it's your job to say, hey, no limitations, never again. And I didn't. In, in fact, I remember after that, you know, moment, I, I thought, there's nothing I won't do for this man. And I didn't share this with you earlier, but I remember we had we had a game my junior season to go to state. And I played really, really good in that second half. I think I had like 19, like all threes. <laughs> Just I got like six threes and, a, and an and one on a three and I hit the free throw, but we lost. And we lost like one guy missed an assignment and just the guy just drained it. I wouldn't even call him crazy, but this is how intentional my coach was with winning. He was so disappointed because of the talent that he had on, on roster that as, as we lost, you know, you shake hands and stuff like that. He was lying on the floor, like in shock, in disbelief. So long that the next teams were doing their layup drills around him. He goes to the locker room, does the speech, seniors, you know, thank you, everybody else. We have, you know, open gym, blah, 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 you know, put your jerseys and throw them in the bag and we'll take care of it. We'll see you guys in a week. And I remember going up to him and I said, and I was the prim and proper kid, but I went up to him and I said, hey, coach, he goes, what? I said, that shit will never happen again. And, you know, you know, I was always raised never to, not to curse anyway, but I was like very like with it. I was like, no, he needs to know. I said, I said, that shit will never happen again. And he goes, whatever, man. And I remember thinking to myself, he's just upset because of what just happened. But I, I remember making sure that following year we were going to win state. And we were going to win it for him because it's the same guy that believed in us more than we believed in ourselves. And we went 27 and two that year, third on the West Coast and 21, 21st in USA Today national poll. Wow. And, and the team that we beat, Ben, was Olympia High School. No way. And the number I wore in the high school. Seven. 22. 22. The number I wore as a competitor in 2011 was 22. Some things just happen. <laughs> no, hey, like like I said, like we talked about before we hit record, and then there's no coincidences, which when we share this story later, yes, sir. people are going to know what it means for there to be no coincidences. Yes, sir. Yeah. Have you thought about writing a book, but just don't have the time? We would love to help you make that dream come true this year. Introducing BNC Publishing. We offer an in-house three-step process to help you bring your book to life. The whole process only takes 60 to 90 days. Compared to 18 months for traditional publishing methods, we work fast. To see if we are a good fit to work together on your project, email our team at info at bennewman.net. That's info at bennewman.net. Now, back to the show. So bre breaking Olympia, the Phil Heath story, Amy and I are watching, man, it was like, 
945. I'm halfway through. Everybody knows I wake up so damn early in the morning. Like I'm usually out by 945. I could not go to bed. Amy's watching with me. She's getting all into it. Man, it goes till 1045. I finish it and Amy's like, I can't believe you're up until 1045. I'm like, I can't go to bed. Like this story is amazing. And Phil, where you went emotionally in the documentary. It, it, I want to start with find your edge in the details and some things that I pulled out, which were amazing, which helped me better understand your mindset and how you did what you did seven times. But then I know there's this whole deeper, passionate level of Phil Heath that wants to help men, women, people in life understand that it's okay to be you. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be authentic. Man, I've got tears watching the documentary the part during the documentary where they pause and we hear your tears with a black screen, like yeah. Phil, this is so deep. This documentary needs to be watched by everybody. How special was it for you for the rock to approach you to have this opportunity to finally tell your story? What was that like for you? Uh, it's a dream come true to be quite honest, because you know, being an athlete and having reporters tell your story is one thing because they usually have an agenda and sometimes that may not serve you, may just serve their narrative, right? And I've been a part of different film projects, which in fact did not share who Phil Heath really is. It's just a facade of something else of what they envisioned a seven time or just a Mr. Olympia wanted to be. This was all about what I wanted. When I was approached with this project, it had nothing to do with protein shakes and training. It had all to do about me to the core. And once I was able to visit with our director, Brett Harvey, I recognized that his intention was to tell a story that's never been told. And that's one of extreme vulnerability. So I, I did the interviews and then I realized, my wife and I both, we realized that's not good enough. That's only good enough for one audience. This needs to be something that everyone can relate to. And in fact, I had stories that I felt like they did, but I never wanted to share them because of the pain, because of the hurt, because of the disappointment and the embarrassment. And then I realized like this will probably be the most therapeutic session I could ever have by sitting in front of a director and him asking me these deeper questions and just run with it and see what happens and, you know, give it up to the man upstairs and just, just run with it. Right. And that's where you get to see some really cool moments within the project. And in fact, I, I felt like there was a great energy without me talking about this to the other members of the film, they all collectively gave themselves to it as well with Jay Cutler, with Ronnie Coleman, with my coach, Hani Rambod, who had lost his father during COVID. It was just incredible to see, you know, we all put a lot into this sport of bodybuilding, but we, you know, we're willing to share our true self, our true emotions on camera, knowing that there could be judgment because, you know, with, with when you're vulnerable, a lot of people are, they refuse to be emotionally available because of the vulnerability being taken advantage of. It could be weaponized and we've all been hurt once or twice in our life to where we're like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to let you see this because if I do, you can hurt me. And I don't like that. This was like, nope, I'm so secure with myself right now. Like this is going to help me help somebody else. And working in that space of speaking in front of large audiences, you know, sports teams and one-on-one -on -one coaching, like how can I pour into anyone else when I don't pour into myself? And that means I have to self audit the hell out of Phil Heath and expose the demons and breaking Olympia allowed me that opportunity. So I, I went for it. it. It's, it's incredible. The, the depths that you go to and the emotion that you show um, before we get to that emotional side, I, I want to attack one thing because there's something that, that blew me away when I was watching. And I, I tend to watch things really scrutinized to the, to the details, which I think why you and I get along so well, because our yeah. brains, like we got these crazy brains, the way we operate and attack the details. Absolutely. But when you would have a competitor, and I want everybody when you're listening 
Do you just show up? And I, I talk about this all the time. There's a difference between focus and intentional focus. And when I was watching the documentary, I realized like, man, Phil just elevated to a level of intentional focus. Like I don't even think I knew existed. <laughs> like I think I could get better with intentional focus and I teach it and talk about it every day. But you would literally not just say I'm competing against Jay Cutler. You would let, you would take pictures of your competition. You, you're, you're marking on their bodies, comparing it to your body. The level of detail that you went to was absolutely amazing, Phil. And I, and I can't imagine that there's other people doing what you did from a focus standpoint to attack those details. How much did those details mean to your ability to do what you did seven times? Oh, thank you so much. I mean, it, it meant everything because, you know, you have to carry yourself a certain level of humility, right? And saying, look, like, th these are the people who I'm going against and they're champions in their own right. And, they, and let's be honest, they don't want to lose either. So what are they not doing? Well, maybe they're doing a self audit, but they're not recognizing the competition. So let me recognize the competition. So if this guy has a little bit better shoulders than I do, or let's say it's the best body part they have and I don't have them. Doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to make up that much ground within one calendar year. No, but what are my strengths? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Maybe if I etch out a little bit more detail here, maybe I create a little bit of roundness here. Maybe by doing that with the shoulders, I can shrink the waist just a quarter of an inch. Because what are most people doing when they train for shows? They want to get bigger. They're just thinking of the scale. I'm thinking about a certain look. And I'm thinking about how much more muscle per square inch I can put on this frame. So therefore, you get two people that let's just say they weigh the same and they actually have the same frame. The difference is going to be the muscle per, muscle per square inch. So if you look at two television screens, both are 60 inches, the one that's 1080p, Okay, the one that's 4K, man. And then you got the 4K OLED, man. Now you got the 8K one. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, like I want to be IMAX 3D everything. <clears throat> and that's how I was like, okay, I got to be meticulous about every gram of protein, carbs, fats, sodium, everything. I got to know that in order to become and stay the champ, I have to gamify everything from the steps on the step mill to, to how much sleep I'm getting to what type of sleep I, I'm getting to understand what modalities are available instead of just spending my money on, you know, garbage. Let's make sure this is this is one for you, Ben. So everybody says, oh, you eat steak. I'm like, yeah, I eat steak. I eat fish. I eat chicken. But. I was going through a company that was their farms, you know, oh, free range, this and that. I wanted to know how they slaughtered them. Think about that. Because if you think about how something is slaughtered, it'll tell you a lot about the quality of the meat or, in fact, the chicken. So if you just cut its heads off, don't you think it's going to tense up? If you do an incision, it's more humane, they bleed out, and it's more relaxed. So then when you cook it and then you reheat it, it's not tough. But if you flash freeze it, it'll be okay. But if you just freeze them, it crystallizes. But when you defrost it, what happens? You have like this little juice on the bottom of it, right? And then you throw it on the, on the stove. You just cooked away all the damn nutrients. So I'm thinking about that. And then I take it a step further. Now I want to know where your water source is. And do they fly planes over it? Because the radiation gets in the water source that gets in the soil that then, this is how I think, bro. Golly. <laughs> That's what I said. Like, I knew, I, and you never told me this stuff. And I'm like, I knew what, I'm like, okay, this is intentional focus on another level. This is like elevated beyond like, this is why you did what you did. And, and Phil, this is unbelievable. 
And and, the, and I know there's people listening. And the great thing about a podcast is I can't see you shaking your head, being upset about what you are, or you aren't doing. But for Phil and I, just stop doing it. Don't trip on anything that's behind you. Phil and I have made so many mistakes and he 100%. continues to make mistakes. I make mistakes. But like if Phil can do that with the meat that he puts in his body to make sure that the nutrients stay in the meat when you cook the meat, then you could be a little more focused when you say goodnight to your kids. You could be a little more focused when you read the book to not just read it, but to read it. You could be more focused when you cook your food. You could be more focused to actually do your workout. You could be more focused in your work so you don't live with regret. So I had to get in, get that in there because you got me hyped just thinking about how I could take intentional focus to a whole nother level. This is unbelievable. No, thank you. And you're absolutely right. You know, I think it's, you know, a person that leaves with great intentions has no regrets, right? A famous person said that. And I think that we all need to continually do that. But then we have to be conscious. And unfortunately, because of, you know, we have laptops, TVs, phones, tablets, noise pulling at us. We think about what? A million thoughts a day. How many of those mean anything? And how many of those are producing anything? What if we could just eliminate more noise so then we can focus on just 10 things? <laughs> just 10 things? Or maybe just one today. Just one yeah. today. I must, no matter what happens, come hell or high water, <clears throat> I'm not going to drink alcohol today. Come hell or high water, when I, when I drive home from work, I might take a little detour slowly drive around the neighborhood and maybe park somewhere about a couple minutes away, text my wife and say, I'll be right home. Turn off the radio and take some deep breaths, recognizing my day. And even if I had the worst freaking day, I am not bringing that home to this woman, these kids. But just being that intentional, right, can make the world a difference. Instead of just driving your ass home, getting out of the truck, slamming the door, and then you have what? What I call the blank stare, which every man has done at some point in time in their life. Hey, honey, how you doing? I'm fine. 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 Hey, dad. Fine. Hey, hey, hey. Meh, 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 meh. That's, that's what comes out of your mouth. You don't know it, but that's what's coming out of your mouth. Mm, eh, eh, eh. Nothing of substance. You're just lights, with lights on, no one home. That's what you are because you're not in your freaking body. Because you haven't taken any time. So it's not something that I just did my whole life. It's something I had to learn. And it's, and I fail at that sometimes. But I have to install and re-update, you know, like, hey, Phil, you just did a full press junket for Breaking Olympia. Did you even manage to take your wife out to dinner? And the answer was no. This was just a few days ago. And I was tired and this and that, and she'll she'll understand. Yeah, dude. But you know what, man? She deserves that extra gear. So what did I think about all night? Phil, you got to have an extra gear just for her. She should not get the worst bit of you after you just gave everything to these photographers and you know journalists and fans. She deserves that extra gear. There's a reserve fuel box that you have for certain things in your life. She deserves that because she's willing to give. And my wife, you'll see, and you saw in the. In oh, the wow. I, I was just going to say, she's awesome. I, I'm not going to give any of it away. You want to talk about sacrifice? You want to yeah. talk about, I mean, it's making me emotional thinking about this. You want to talk about love? You want to talk about two people who supporting each other? There's so much to Breaking Olympia that like people think that they think what they're going to watch. You don't even know what you're going to watch. Yeah, they're not. And I, I'm just so, and I appreciate that, brother. Yeah, Cherie's everything, you know. And yeah, it, it, but those are those things. It's like we have to carry ourselves with greater understanding of how we show up, how we show up for work how versus how we show up at home and vice versa. And you know, for, I can only speak for men out there, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we're dealing with a lot of pain and it's how we understand it and how we're able to communicate it in a healthy way, but to get through it. Because a lot of the times we're, we're just 
And I get it. Top performers, high performers, we all do this. You know, you're, you're, you're tucking under, you're tucking under. But at some point in time, you're going to have to address it. You got to address it. And if you can put real words to it by sitting in an empty room sometime and just whether it be journaling, you know, whether it be hiring a coach or a therapist to get these words out and to understand how to communicate. So when the next obstacle comes, you know how to get through it because you can't always go over it or go under it or go around it. Sometimes you got to get through it. If you really go through it, that means you go through the pain. That means you go through the BS. You go through the the disappointment, the everything. It's like Andy Dufresne and freaking Shawshank. He had to go through the three football fields of crap to get through to the promised land. Where are you doing that in your life? You're, you, you don't want to do it because you know that it's going to hurt. You don't want to go through it all because you know it's going to be painful. It's going to unveil some different parts about you that's not so perfect. But in order to be of someone of substance, of high quality, a high value that can pour into other people that you care about, you got to go through it. You can't always go around it. And your, your injury that you sustained, which took you through a different level of pain, which opened up a deeper level of emotion, which showed a support from Cherie, even when there was almost resistance to it, which we tend to do as these high charging, high performing individuals. And you had a career that was like, injury free i mean other than i mean you go back to you know basketball days but from when you stopped hooping to really this amazing run seven times mr olympia like it was relatively injury free and then this significant injury which you guys will see but i i'd like to discuss before we we talk about this unbelievable coincidence of ours what was it like going through what you went through phil going to that that deep place of darkness yeah. that you hadn't experienced, which was probably masked by bright lights, a perfect body that you became obsessed with tweaking every mm -hmm. inch. But when you had to go to that dark place, what got you through it and how important is it for even a champion like you, one of the best to ever walk the face of the earth doing what you did? How important is it to be transparent, to be vulnerable and to figure out what really goes on in your heart, your mind and your spirit? It's the greatest superpower that you could find. The minute, you know, for, for context, if you think of any hero's journey, they all had to be aware of something that was within them, see that something is greatly possible through work, face their own fears, which is really themselves, face themselves in the mirror or Luke Skywalker go through the cave or, you know, Neo in the matrix or whatever you want to call it. You got to, you got to face yourself. You got to know everything it is about you. And then you have to apply it with such relentlessness. You have to be mm -hmm. so tenacious that people just get out of the way. And you, and if they don't, you, you, <laughs> you show them the door, you move through them. It's move over, get ran to F over time. And you're, and you don't care. And you can't always care about, you know, being promoted to a higher level and, and over your friends, over your colleagues. You know, the circle will get smaller and you, and you have to be happy about that. And it, and it's, it's not for everybody. You know, I would get ready for those shows and I realized like pff, that that friendship right there is going to end soon. I can see it because this person is, this person has been stealing from me, man, all those years. And he doesn't think I know. Mm. Okay. This person has been talking behind my back and he don't think I know. Okay. All right. But I still got to go to work. I got to go do my thing. It doesn't matter. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. You know, people come and go, whether it be in the physical form or not, you know, like, but overall, I just recognize that I have an opportunity. And once basketball didn't work out and I got into bodybuilding, I had to kind of look back and be like, <laughs> start laughing, especially during those hard leg, leg days, you know, where you're like, I can't do no more. You start thinking, Yes, you can. 
What would my future version of self say? He'd say, get your ass up and get to work, Phil. You got more greatness within you. Don't you want to be the champion? Don't. And what are you declaring, Phil? So when I won, I said I wanted to win 10 Mr. Olympias. And people called me every name in the book, Ben. I mean, everything. Things that I can't even say. But what I can tell you is that that was their own insecurity. And I said, watch me. Watch <laughs> me do it. And I'm going to do it with that, you know, that that grim, that grin, that grimace, that that Mamba mentality look, that Jordan smirk, that that Ali, like, you know, like whatever you want to call it. I mean, I nick my, nicknamed myself the freaking dream killer because I'm going to crush your dreams because you're trying to crush mine. And I'm going to get you first. And I'm going to beat you so bad that you'll never want to show up again. And that's how I looked at it. I mean, I was nuts. But I realized that you have to be. You have to be nuts to be so detail-oriented with your body, with mm -hmm. every ounce of protein to every ounce of sleep to understanding that every modality out there from hyperbaric to acupuncture to decompression to infrared saunas to like all this stuff collectively. And this was like 15 years ago before anybody knew about this stuff. I was the one going online trying to figure out stuff. I was the one figuring out, okay, where, like, who's the best doctor in Denver? Okay, what is this person doing? I'm finding out what other Olympic athletes are doing in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center. I'm now trying to get a new sponsorship so I can invest that money into what they're doing, bringing it into my house. Like, that's what it takes. And you gamify everything. Because I must be on the highest score on that pinball machine. I must be. I, I, and you know what the cool thing about that is? Is that what do we do if you if any old school guys or new school guys that ever go to an arcade? Go to an arcade. The beautiful thing about it is they always save the highest scores. Always. Uh, always. So maybe this was all derived from the fact that maybe when I was a kid, going to a pizza joint, you know, where the tabletop video games were or whatever, I wanted to have that high score. You know why? Because that meant that every time I would go back to that arcade, I'd stand there and wait to see where I was, if mm. I was still in that top 10. But where, and I, I always challenge people, where are you doing that in your life? You're, where are you willing to really put it on the line to say, no, I want to be on that reader board. Put, show the stats. If you're in sales and you got a team, show the stats. Put them out there for everybody to see. Now we know. And now you know why that person got a raise. And you didn't. And then you realize what work they had to put in. So I was always about that. I'm still about that. I'm like freaking fired up right now because I'm like, I, I got to gamify more stuff. <laughs> I got to get more, you know, like I, I have to, because these lights are going to get shut off, man. I'm not promised tomorrow. And I got to know that I gave it everything because it was required, man. It's not going to, and it's also Ben. we already know, like your plot of land where you're going to be buried. It ain't going to say seven times Mr. Olympia on it. It's going to have my full government name on there. But what follows underneath of it is something of value. That is what I'm working for. I don't want lies in my obituary. I don't want anyone to have to lie and to sugarcoat something to make me look cool in my obituary. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. Think about how many people probably have been to a funeral and people are like, man, he wasn't really like that. But no, I want people to be like, yeah, no, he, he was that dude. He wasn't perfect, but he was, yeah. He he worked hard and he gave back and he wanted to see everybody win because he's won. Yeah, there's a there's a and it comes out in the documentary. There's this special deep side of Phil Heath that you guys think you're hearing it now. Everybody needs to watch this documentary. <laughs> and oh, so that you you can feel it, you can experience it, and there's no doubt in my mind <clears throat> that what you will continue to do. And I, I want to be a part of it in connecting you with it to, for your story to be told as many times as possible, because there is no doubt with the strength that lies in you that, that came from a lot of pain, that these next chapters will be greater 
than what people know of Phil Heath. And a lot of that comes from how we choose to live with the days we're given that other people cannot get. And, you know, I, I watch, and it's such a powerful way for us to, to finish. I watch the documentary and I see this relationship that you have with your dad and even this unique picture. I'm going to let people watch it and see it, but just your level of detail of what you saw. And it, it, it was, it's amazing. But then we see your father passing away and your father dying. And obviously I'm sad watching the documentary. You're, you're losing your father and, and you're trying with your crazy schedule of competing to get there to see him as often as you can and flying when you don't even have the time to do it, but you're doing it because that's what your heart tells you and that's who you are. Your father passes away. And you and I, we're just cutting it up before we hit record today. And I'm telling you parts of my story. And I mentioned how my mom dies from amyloidosis. And you put your hand over your face and you look down and I'm like, wait a second. You finally look up and your father died of amyloidosis. Yeah. And before you share how powerful no coincidences means to you, me almost doing this 20 years, you all who have listened to the podcast, you've heard me do solo episodes talking about my mom and she was only the second woman under 40 years old they'd ever seen or heard of the disease and you can give statistics and there's still no cure. But I'm going to give you two stats and then I'm going to turn it over to Phil to talk about the power of how there's no coincidence and how we will forever be tied on a level that I don't think we ever could have possibly expected from Ed saying we needed to meet and Grover and Dr. Lyon. Because now it's like a brotherhood that, that I don't even people think people can really understand. Phil is maybe the ninth or tenth person I've ever met in my life who had somebody die from amyloidosis that was that close to them. Most people, I mean, maybe there's a couple handfuls of people who even knew what it was, but like actually mm -hmm. somebody who I'm the first person that Phil's ever met who had a loved one who died from amyloidosis. That is how rare amyloidosis is. Phil, I don't know what you felt, but there was just this amazing bond you and I'll forever have. I, I'm, I'm still—I mean, it just happened an hour ago. I, I—I yeah. I, I don't. I can't even put it into words. No, it's you know you 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 meet people. We met finally, and you're right, man. Like you know, you meet people, and you're like, man, we just vibe out. And as we were both talking in that gym. It was like we were staring at each other, not sizing each other up, but just the intention. And now I know why. Now I know why. Because we were connecting with each other. Soul connection. And to have that, oh, man, brother. I always knew you were my people, man. <laughs> I always knew that. And to, to have this. You're right. I never met someone. Never. And right when you said it, even now, I'm just like, wow. And for con added context, <clears throat> it'll be 10 years tomorrow, March 29th. And it, it, it hurts, you know, but through that, you realize that there's other people. And I believe that that's what life is about, is to f find community wherever you can, to be open, to be vulnerable, Don't, not to be scared to be vulnerable, because you just might be able to find your people and you're not alone. If you wouldn't have shared that, I wouldn't have shared that, right? And you had to be willing to share that. And I had to be willing to just listen. And I'm just thankful. I'm thankful, man. I know our parents are like, yes. Because <laughs> see, they see things in a much more quantum field realm. And they knew that it was going to happen. 
And I'm just glad that it did because we'll always be tied to that and many other things. So for everyone listening, I mean, it's just remind yourself that life is worth living. Be open to new conversations. But be intentional when you speak to someone because it is your your time to engage or to disengage at some point, you know. But I tell you what, man, I, I'm so thankful for you, Ben. And um, wow, <laughs> I, I needed this conversation because I, I still, every year, man, <laughs> every year it hurts. Oh, man, it hurts so bad because I wasn't raised by my father and we started making amends and he got to see me compete. Thank God he got to see me win. But one of my greatest achievements was to know that he was there rooting me on and I was able to capture some of those moments in this film. And I, and I do know that it will um, bring a lot of other people closer together through this film. So I'm just, you made my day, brother. And I love you, man, because you, you, you fight, you work your butt off and you fight some more, man. And mm-hmm. you just keep going. And, you know, you have your, your heart. And that's something that I know a lot of men need to, they need to see from us, right? So then they can get through their own stuff. We're all carrying so much weight. And I'm over here in tears because I'm like, I'm alive. And I'm experiencing life. And, and I want people to do the same. I just want everybody to do the same. I don't want them to miss out on this beautiful alchemy of human experience to to just enjoy And to get through this pain the best way you can by connecting with somebody else. Oh, man. Phil, I I love you too, brother. And this is the beginning of a very, very strong friendship. And it's going to make me so emotional to say this. but And we're going to drop all the links for you guys to see the documentary and all that. But we're going to end the burn differently because that was really just the mic drop. But. You said something, and this is how I, I want to finish. You said, my tombstone is not going to say, seven-time Mr. Olympia, it's going to have my God-given legal name, and then there's going to be something underneath it. And something tells me those words are going to say, his greatest strength lied within. And um, Damn. this documentary, people are going to see that in you, and you you alluded to it coaching and speaking and the things you can do. I meant it when I said it because of that strength that lies within you, that people are now getting a chance to see brother, you are going to win more times. Those, those 10 Mr. Olympias are going to come in another way. These next championships are going to be greater and anything I can do to make that a reality. I'm going to fight for you, brother, because you, your, your greatest strength lies from within. Thank you, brother. Wow. Thank you. Man, <laughs> I gotta see you, dude. Like, <laughs> man. <laughs> oh, oh God, man. God bless you, brother. Yeah, People are probably too, like, brother. man, how did how did these two uh, guys that we didn't expect this to happen take us here? And I'm just, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for everybody that listens to the burn. And like, I'm telling you right now, I'm normally not this straight. You all better share this with somebody that you deeply care about. And maybe it's that person where the relationship's broken right now and you want to re-engage or it's that person that you just want to just, this episode has got to be shared. I love each and every single one of you that spend time with us every single week. And this is, this is, if not the most, one of the most special episodes of the burn we have ever had. Phil, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, Thank you for having me. And I wish you guys all the best. God bless you all. Thank you. 